Welcome to a new video. Let's take a look at some new malicious compliance stories. The first story is called, I am not allowed to fix this. We needed to run a network cable from one room to an adjacent room about 20 years ago in a university computer science department. The doors to these rooms had a nice gap underneath. My boss told me, just get a 50 inch network cable and run it under the door like the other two that are already there. Wouldn't it be better to do it properly? Through the walls and all that? Trust me, under the door is way better. That doesn't make any sense. Let me tell you a story. Physical plant is unionized here. Their contract says that if any of certain kinds of work is to be done, it must be done by unionized people. Non-unionized workers doing union work is one of the few things that can get a person fired almost instantly at a university. A few years ago, they got network cable installation and repair added to that list so it would be illegal and could get the university sued if somebody else did the cabling. That sounds annoying. Also, nobody trained them on how to do data cabling. What? So here's how it goes. You put in a work order, they show up in a week or two, about an hour before quitting time. They put up a ladder, take down a ceiling tile, and dangle an ethernet cable from the ceiling, then leave early for the day. They will come back the next day about an hour before lunch, do 10 minutes of work, then leave early for lunch. Several days later, the network run will be done, and they'll leave. You will then discover it doesn't work. If you are particularly unlucky, you will also discover several existing connections that had nothing to do with the change are also broken. But I still think that we should do it properly. You still have much to learn. Fine. We'll try it your way. You'll see. Shall we ask them to cable up those two existing runs under the doors properly also? That sounds good. So sure enough, just as my boss predicted, a week later a cable installer shows up, not long before lunch. I walk by the room a few minutes later, there's a ladder, a hole in the ceiling, and no installer. A few days later, the work order is closed and the ladder is gone. My boss said, follow me. I follow him into one of the rooms. Hanging out of the wall are three ethernet cables. One of the cables has a wire sticking out next to the end, not in it. Also, no plates, no jacks, and no electrical box. Just an ugly looking hole in the drywall with wires hanging out. I asked, you did ask for jacks, right? Of course. What now? I make a work order for them to fix it. A week or so passes, and now the cables are punched down into jacks. But there was still, no wall plate, they were still just hanging out of a hole. Another week or two and they're in a plate, looking all proper. My boss said, why don't you go test the new runs? Sure thing, boss. It should be no surprise to you at this point that zero out of three network ports worked. I said, and so I guess we need to make a work order for them to figure out what's wrong with the runs? They will refuse to do that, on the grounds that it's not in their job description. They will install and repair but not diagnose. How do we deal with this then? My boss then, with a hint of fear and a measure of secrecy, grabbed a punch tool that was hidden in the room. He took me to the jack in question, and educated me on the art of ethernet connections, pointing out the color legend on the backside of the jacks and how the cabling didn't match it. Now you've got to understand one thing about my boss, he was a genius about navigating bureaucracy, but he always stayed strictly within the letter of the rules. I am telling you, you are not permitted to repair this cable. However, in order to figure out whether the problem was incorrect placement, you may need to move these wires. I will let you figure it out from here. And keep the door locked while you're using the punch tool. In fact, just keep the punch tool completely out of sight. Got it? I proceed to punch the connections into the right jacks. And wonder of wonders, they seem to work. So I go back to boss's office. So what did you do? Well. And before you say anything, pretend I'm the dean. Think carefully. Well, I diagnosed them. And all of a sudden, they worked. And? And maybe they were working all along and I just did something wrong. You just took a step towards enlightenment. Well done. Thanks. Now let me ask you a question. What do you think the likelihood is, that on at least one of those new runs, you'll find they ran out of cable and used eight poorly attached wire nuts to splice cables together? I'm starting to get the feeling like I'd rather not answer that question. Another step towards enlightenment. Would you like to crawl up in the ceiling and inspect the runs? I think it would be better not to know. Yes. And next time I tell you to run ethernet cables under the door, what are you going to do? Trust that you know what you're doing. The next story is called, you signed it, you have to follow it. A few years ago, I lived with a roommate in a small house. It was a cozy home in a nice area, but the crazy landlady didn't like to do repairs. This led to a lot of small issues around the home. The landlady was also, well, crazy. 
We would find notes and boxes of chocolates in our kitchen every holiday or occasion, times when she would just walk in when nobody was home and without notice. Nice and creepy at the same time, sums up how we felt about her our first year. She would limit all personal contact with us, and stayed about five or more feet away any time we met her. She also demanded that we travel to the opposite side of the city to pay rent in cash without a receipt at her home. I obviously objected to this, but my roommate was the leaseholder and didn't want to rock the boat. Her lack of repairs eventually led to flooding issues that could have been easily fixed. The drain was clogged with roots and the toilet perpetually filled with water due to a broken bobber. This combined to two separate major floods. First one, it rained water into the basement. The second flood, the drain gave out altogether and two feet of water flooded the basement. I woke up to smoke filling the room, and I had to fight through shocks to unplug everything. Here's where things went downhill. We received a water bill for around $3,500, saying it was a final notice after failing to pay any of the bill in the year we had lived in the house. Our water was shut off the same day. We didn't even know we had to pay water and had never received a single bill. My roommate found a note in the kitchen, presumably from the old leaseholder, with the water company phone number listed on it. We figured we missed it and prepared to take the financial blame for it. We still had no water though, and it couldn't be connected with an outstanding bill. The bill was in my roommate's name, so we made a plan. Switching the lease to my name as the lease renewal time was upon us and would let us put the bill in my name, giving us both running water and time to pay the old bill. We called the landlady, and she told me just to sign the lease papers she sent my roommate. Unfortunately, my roommate had other plans. He decided to take off, leaving me with a lease I couldn't afford on my own. I did the math and realized I would be bankrupt in a few months on my own without a roommate. I went to the government agency in my area that deals with these sorts of situations and explained the situation. They said they would look into it and I left. They called her and it shook the hornet's nest. Halfway home, I started getting voicemails from the landlady. I only text, so my voicemail was never activated. It just says my number and no name. The landlady said, hello, too scared to put your name up? How many people are you hiding from? You're not hiding from me. I know your roommate didn't leave, you just want to stick me with that flood bill again. Well, guess what? I just called around and I had all of his debt put in your name. Since you went to the government agency to get out of your lease, you're screwed. They're going to make you give me both nickels you rub together. You want out? Fine, but pay the entire thing off. You owe main $12000 by tomorrow. I'll own you when this is done you low life. Now be a man and pay your bills. The messages continued, each starting with angrily repeating my phone number as if it was somehow evidence of my corruption. I doubled back to the government agency and played them the messages. This is where the hero of the story comes in. She called the water company on speakerphone, discovering that the landlady had, in fact, tried to have them switch my roommate's debt into my name. They obviously couldn't do that. If debt worked like that, everyone could just pick the richest person and offload a debt to them without permission or authority. The landlady even tried lying to the water company, telling them I was the actual previous leaseholder but backpedaled after being asked to provide documents stating such. The agency hero called her, wanting to try to negotiate a deal between us. The landlady kept it brief and to the point before hanging up. She said, you signed the lease, you have to follow it. The lease states that you have to pay the entire lease out if you want out. Either way, you owe main $12000 and the water company another $3500. I was upset, but the agency worker seemed even angrier than me. She collected my paperwork and sent me on my way while she went over it all. She warned me that the situation was in the landlady's favor at the moment overall, but of course, I had nothing to do with the water bill. I had already called them myself the day my roommate left, only to be told I wasn't even authorized to pay it if I could. Only my former roommate could pay. Still, the landlady seemed hell-bent on transferring it. I think she confused them telling her the bill was in my name going forward with it was transferred retroactively. A few days later, the agency worker called me back to her office. When I arrived, she had the biggest grin on her face. She asked, are these the only documents you signed? Are you sure? Are you absolutely positive? It turns out that the documents I signed were not a lease, they were a lease renewal agreement. I was young, it was my first lease, and I didn't know any better. As the landlady used this as the main lease document, without attaching the original for me to read the terms, it was considered a vague contract with no stipulations attached. All vagueness in a contract goes in favor of the one signing it, not the drafter. The agency worker looked at the lease that the landlady gave them from my roommate, same thing. So she called the landlady, while I sat, watching in awe. 
I will skip the part where the agency worker is explaining the situation to the landlady and jump to the good parts. As the original lease is not considered a part of the agreement, it appears that both of your former tenants paid into various things that were not required of them. All of these fees will need to be refunded. Key deposits, security deposits, the deposit of the last month of rent, fees for use of the garage, and all utility fees. There is also no penalty for your tenant negating his contract though you are still entitled to keep the payment you received for the first month rent on the new lease as agreed. What the hell is this? The other agent said I won. Put your boss on. I'm sorry, but I am the supervisor on shift today. The other agent you spoke with didn't have access to all of the paperwork needed to understand the situation. I'm not paying that low life a dime. This is criminal. You sign the lease, you have to follow it. The lease states that your tenants only had to pay rent. You owe him just over $2,000, plus an additional $3,000, as he has provided receipts showing that he has been paying your electricity bill in his own name under false pretenses for the past year. Since the lease is about to go into effect, you are also required to ensure the home is in a livable state. By tomorrow, it needs to have the mold damage found by our inspectors fixed, the water needs to be running, and various other health and safety concerns need to be addressed. You've had nearly two weeks to address the concerns we sent you, so we trust that will be fixed by now. If the home is unlivable at the start of the lease, you will be required to pay for accommodations at a hotel for him until the repairs are complete. Remember how the landlady was so insistent on switching my roommate's water bill debt to my name? I was able to sit and listen in while the agency worker called the water company to do the impossible to the landlady. My roommate's debt was transferred to the landlady after the government agency gave them the appropriate documents justifying it of course. The landlady was livid but reimbursed me. She only paid me back what I paid her directly, I never ended up getting the rest back from her. Honestly, it was water under the bridge to me and I felt she made herself suffer enough already anyway. I knew she could afford to pay me back what I had just given her, but I didn't want to risk hurting her family over the rest either. The water bill needed to be paid in full too, or it would risk her service at her own home. Though I skipped most of it to save time and space, the landlady harassed me numerous times during the two weeks leading up to my lease taking effect. By the end, the police warned her to avoid harassing me, the water company, and the agent she spoke with at the government agency, as each was close to filing charges against her. I never saw anyone in this story again. I assume the agency worker is still running things like a true hero at her office. The landlady never contacted me again but told the neighbors and new tenants I was a lowlife who ran out on my bills. I haven't seen or heard from my former roommate since, though I do hope he is doing well all things set aside. The landlady owes him money too if he ever checks up on it though. I'm doing fine. Found cheaper rent, use the difference to pay for college courses. Another layer of revenge, improving your life when others want nothing more than to see you fail. The last story is called, You Don't Want Me To Lie. When I was fairly young, my parents separated and then divorced. My father eventually moved to a small town up the coast. I stayed with my mum and soon-to-be stepfather. From ages 4 to 10, I lived with my mum and him, spending holidays with my dad up the coast. A little after I turned 10, my mum asked what I wanted to do. Live with my dad or come with them when they moved to a small mountain town. I decided to move to my dad. For the first year with my dad, it was fine. We didn't have much money, but we managed. I finished grade 5 and over the summer, he had decided he wanted to move and get a roommate. Except this roommate was a woman that I didn't like. There was something wrong with her that I couldn't figure out till I was older. She immediately tried to supplant my mother. She would discipline me, teach me chores, etc. All the things I would need to learn regardless. What bothered me was that my dad wanted her and he basically just let her walk all over him. He ended up paying the majority of the bills, she took over the space, her word was law, etc. At some point, she got pregnant by her then boyfriend. He was a well-off musician with family money and lots of property, so she scored. Was she happy with that? No. She would drive around with me in the car. One of the places she would stop was some ramshackle trailer. I was always left in the car when we went there. Sometimes she would leave the trailer looking very disheveled and a tall blonde guy would grab at her as she walked to the car. At the time I was 11 years old and had a pretty good idea of what she was doing. I had no plans on saying anything. I knew the father of her baby and I liked him well enough, but I didn't think it was any of my business. At least until she pulled some bad moves on me. I can't even remember what she screamed at me for, but I got lectured and she told me that I must always tell the truth. Lying was bad, etc. My dad stood there and just let her. Shortly after her tirade, she had left to visit the guy in the trailer. Not too long after that, the phone rang. This was before the time of cell phones. 
It was the father of the baby, trying to contact her. Apparently they had made plans to meet up in a couple of hours and he was looking to speak to her. Hey, kid. Is she there? I have a moment of clarity. Hi, no, sorry, she isn't home. She's at the trailer guy's place. A moment of silence. Did you say trailer guy? Yes, she left about 45 minutes ago. He sounded clearly distressed. Thanks, kid. Nothing happened for the rest of the night, at least that I know of. The next day was a complete rampage. She came home and went straight for me. Screaming, crying, throwing things. My dad rushed in and asked what was going on. She told the father of my baby about the trailer guy. How dare you? He broke up with me. He wants nothing to do with me and it's all her fault. She's ranting and crying. She ended up revealing the truth. While she was visiting the trailer guy, the father of the baby showed up and banged on the door. Apparently he knew exactly who I was talking about. Whether they were in the same group of friends or something else I still have no idea. He yelled and banged on the trailer until she came out. He confronted her about her cheating, whether her pregnancy was even real, if the baby was his, etc. The trailer guy had no idea about her pregnancy and freaked out as well. Both of them completely shunned her and left her standing there with her clothes and her car. She apparently spent the rest of the night driving around until she ended up at the baby's father's house and went crazy on his door. Demanding he let her in and take her back, etc. He ended up calling the police on her and they escorted her off his property with a warning. Eventually, she made her way home and decided to take her anger out on me. She is screaming and asks me why I would do something that would destroy her life. You told me that I shouldn't ever lie. So I did what you asked me, I told the truth. That isn't what I meant about always telling the truth. My dad interrupted her, she's right. You punished her for not telling the truth. She only did what you asked her to do. She looked like a guppy, mouth agape and sputtering and then she stormed off. I later found out that the father of the baby only agreed to child support and some visitation, but not in her company. I never heard about the trailer guy again. My dad ended up moving to another small place. I ended up moving in with my mum and stepdad for two years before moving back in with my dad. She never recovered and she became a thorn in my side for years to come. Thanks for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider subscribing to the channel for more content. Let me know what you think about the stories in the comment section below. Have a great day. Bye bye.